Welcome. <laughs> I figured I wouldn't have to do much to get you to cheer. So I love it. So do me a favor. As Olivia gets ready to lead us, let's ask the Lord. Let's, let's not just do the conference thing. Let's ask the Lord to really set these few days apart for his presence, his power. We want more of the Lord. And so right now, if you would, just for the, for the conference folks that are yet to come, we're going to pray for them too. So do me a favor. Close your eyes. Lift your hands. Let's invite the presence of the Lord. Holy Spirit, we're asking. We're wanting to do more than a conference, and we're wanting more than just to sing. We're wanting your presence. We're wanting you to increase in our midst. We're wanting you to move on our hearts, on our minds. We want power. I'm asking, Lord, for an increase of healings, testimonies, salvations, deliverance. God, I'm asking that you would break in on this conference like we haven't seen before. I'm asking God, do things we haven't seen before. We're inviting you, but more than that, we're longing for you. And so we're asking, all over this room, we give this weekend to you, and we're asking, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, Lord, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside.
loved us, therefore we love you in response. Lord, I ask that you would give us a fresh baptism of your love. Lord, would you tell us again that you enjoy us? Would you tell us again that you love us, that you really like us? God, we want to hear your voice and we want to see your face. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. Thank you, Olivia Buckles. 
Thank you, worship team. Great job. Well, welcome to Fascinate 2017. <laughs> I'm not going to be one of those youth pastors when the clapping and the applause is only like a two. I'm not going to be one of those guys that's like, come on, you can do better than that. But come on, that was... I was a little that sleepy. Was that was a little pathetic. sleepy, but I'm not going to ask for a second round. That would be desperate. Okay. My name is uh, David Slyker. I'm going to be one of your hosts for this conference along with Isaac Bennett. Come on. So you got a slightly bigger cheer than the conference. Only slightly though. Yeah. But anyways, so... We're so uh, just eager to see what the Lord has for us this year. We're so glad that you're here with us to see what the Lord does. To, we, I love this time of year. But uh, here's what I want to do. I, I do this every time to open our conference, and I love doing it. If you're here, you're a youth pastor, you're a youth leader, or you're a youth chaperone. There's some of you that you got conscripted last minute, you're, and you're wondering <laughs> why you're here. But uh, you're a youth leader. You're, you, you now can carry the card for life. I want to invite you to stand. I want to pray for you. We're, we are really thankful for you. Come on. It's good to see you guys. We're so thankful for you. So thankful for what you do. I understand the, youth, the last second youth chaperone. You're the most heroic, actually. The youth pastor is the least. Because they, wow. they knew what they knew what they were getting bro. into. But uh, the youth chaperone is about to find out tonight what they got into. Okay, so <laughs> stretch out your hands towards them, or if you're near them, lay a hand on them. We want to ask the Lord. See, we believe that this conference isn't just for the teenagers. We believe that the Holy Spirit has something for each and every one of you. And so we're asking the Lord, Heavenly Father, right now, I'm asking right now, all over this room, every youth pastor, every youth leader, every everyone that came to serve teenagers, we're asking that they would be surprised by the Holy Spirit at this conference. Even the ones that came expecting, I'm asking that you would surprise them, that you would give them something fresh and powerful, that when they head home after the weekend, they would have their world turned upside down by the God that is beyond. Anything we could have asked or imagined or expected or hoped for, you're, you so love to do more. And so I'm asking, refreshing Reenvisioning. I'm asking for fresh life and fresh joy. Your delight and your pleasure in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So glad that you're here. Well, throughout the conference, we're going to uh, recommend to you just different resources for those of you that get touched by different messages, different ideas that strike you, or just different things that the Lord says, and, and you're going, okay, I want more of that, either worship or materials. We're going to be recommending, of course, all throughout the conference, different things. And I'm going to start. Corey Russell's coming out in a moment. Come on. And uh, if, you, if you get hit with what he shares this afternoon and you're going, I need more of that, Corey has an online course coming up through our online school. I help you online. You can uh, jump into that. And here's what's great about it. It's not a video of Corey and you're kind of listening. This is Corey uh, praying for, interacting with, loving on, and ministering to personally those that connect with this class. So because it's not Corey in a video, it's actually Corey interacting. Because of that, we've had people take this course and get healed, get set free. They've, we've had people have a significant times of encountering the Holy Spirit just by connecting to this. And so I'm not saying that's going to happen to you. I'm just saying it's a lot more than you may think. And so if you want to connect that way, for conference attendees, we're giving you a 20% discount, so jump in if you want to. In addition to that, uh, he has an album out. It's called Ask of Me, and what he does is he takes, if, you act, if you've ever heard him preach before, uh, he's a pretty fiery preacher, as we're about to hear just in a few moments, but he takes these like portions of his preaching, and then they put it to really engaging, cool music in the background, and uh, he has an album called Ask of Me. I want you to pick this up. Um, one of my favorite tracks on here is literally called The Stupid Room uh, on, <laughs> on track five. So if you've heard that message before, that makes more sense to you. But if you haven't, I really want to encourage you to get this. Also, my <laughs> sister has a song on this album that she uh, wrote with Corey to be able to, to publish on this. So it's kind of like a personal thing for me as well. But uh, just really intense, really fiery. I put this on in my car and I just get lost in the glory of Jesus and cry. And I remember the first time listening 
to one of Corey's preaching albums in my car and just pulling, I had to literally pull over my car to the side of the road because I was just being so touched by the Holy Spirit through what he was sharing. And so I want to encourage you to pick that up in our bookstore during this conference. Also, those of you that really enjoyed Olivia Buckles and her team this afternoon, come on, that was so good. We so appreciate Olivia. She, she, got a bigger just a, cheer. she got a bigger cheer than you and the conference combined, she, actually. She can sing really good. <laughs> and uh, we just really so appreciate her, her ministry here. She has an EP available. We're out of the physical copies because they're selling like crazy. But there's a, there's a link up there. It's available on iTunes. You can go and download her iTunes album for her EP as well. Well, one last thing, youth pastors and youth leaders, every morning, Friday, Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, we do a Coffee Connect. If you want to come, get coffee. We want to meet you. We want to hear your stories and, and see. Just We love hearing what the Lord's doing. And so that's uh, right back there. Uh, you can uh, meet us for coffee, and it's going to be fun. Is, am I right? It's right back there? I'm, yeah, he- I'm right hesitating because... It's under the bleachers on that side. Yep. I hate saying it's by the bathrooms. That's why I, that's why yeah, that's, I choked that, on my words. Well, that sounds creepy, it but does. it really is. It, it really does. You actually have to go <laughs> to, towards the men's room and then turn right to get into the classroom where the Coffee Connect is. That sounds so, way more yeah. dank than it is. It's yeah. actually cool We'll when you meet you guys near the bathroom for coffee in the morning. <laughs> you just, no one will come, but we'll be there, and we'll, we'll get all the coffee. See you for coffee tomorrow. Yep. Okay, so this is... That was the worst announcement ever. This is Maya Russell. This is Corey's daughter. His daughter. And uh, so, Father, we just ask right now, as she prepares to to play and and just uh, set the table for your presence, we're asking that she would come, that she would move in power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Amen. Hey. <laughs> she just wants to run off the stage, but this was the most, this is my greatest memories already happened. My greatest highlight of Fascinate 2017 just happened. It was my daughter, my middle daughter. She ran off. She gets all embarrassed, but uh, Maya's my middle daughter. We, uh, she was, actually, I'll just share a cool little story with you. I, in about 2002, I got just wrecked with the book of Jeremiah. And um, we came out of the season of just really getting encountered with the book. And me and my wife said, hey, let, let's, let's have a baby and let's, <laughs> let's name the child Jeremiah. <laughs> Why not? The Lord's on Jeremiah. And so uh, we ended up getting pregnant shortly after. We went through two ultrasounds. And I was convinced, you know, Jeremiah, I was thinking it's a boy. Still two ultrasounds we couldn't see. And finally, March 4th, 2003 came. And out comes a girl, and so we knocked off Jera and named her Maya. And I'm here to tell you the spirit of Jeremiah is on this girl, her heart for Jesus, and she's just such a delight to my heart as well as all my daughters. I have my 17-year-old daughter Trinity around here, and then we have a 7-year-old daughter Hadassah, and so I'm blessed. Amen. How's everybody doing? Wow, that was overwhelming. Good. All right, good. I guess that's part of this first session. All right, turn to Luke 18. <laughs> We've been here for the last, I don't know, 17 years. We moved here in December of 2000, so almost 17 years we've been here. IHOP Kansas City has been going for almost 18 years of day and night worship and prayer. And uh, it's just been such an honor. We're natives. We're from northwest Arkansas. And uh, amen. And uh, just been so honored to be here. Father, we love you so much. We're so grateful that you're marking teenagers and that you're marking young adults and you're marking young and old alike, God, with the spirit of prophecy, what you're doing in this hour. And Father, we ask you for fascination of Jesus Christ. We ask you, give us fascination. Fascinate our hearts. Psalm 119, verse 18, open my eyes that I would see wondrous things. God, we ask you to release wonder this weekend. We ask you to spark our hearts with wonder of the man Jesus and that we would never recover from what you do in these four days. We ask you to touch us and meet us in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right, well, I want to begin in Luke 18, and I want to talk to you about the revelation of mercy. And uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, at, the, we, at the, very, the very first Monday or Wednesday of every month, we set apart as a whole missions base. We shut things down, and we spend those the first Monday to Wednesday of every month in what we call our global bridegroom fast. And we spend three days in prayer and fasting, setting our hearts before the Lord. And nothing has been more revolutionary in my spiritual life than the GBF and what it does. And on the very first day of the, com uh, of the, uh, uh, of the fast, the Holy Spirit just began to drop into my heart his cry for mercy, and specifically Luke 18. And I knew that the Lord was speaking to me and something that he wanted to release here today. Luke 18 is a very important passage for the prayer movement. We have it on our wall. If you were to travel down to our prayer room, we have a, on our wall, shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night. Jesus gives us a parable, the first parable in Luke 18, to say, I want to see that men and women, young and old, would pray and not lose heart, that in the same way a widow saw breakthrough from an unjust judge, Jesus declared that there's coming a day that his own elect, his sons, his daughters, the church across the earth, would cry out day and night in prayer, rooted in intimacy of knowing who they are and knowing who God is, and that when they cry out day and night, speedy justice will break in. Justice looking like revival in our cities, looking like the breakout of the kingdom, the release of signs and wonders and miracles, that the church would be set on fire. And Jesus tells us that this would be one of the signs that we're living in the generation of his return, is that we would begin to see day and night prayer unto the release of breakthrough, justice, and power break out. This is one of our foundational passages here. It's one that, that you want to know and, and one that we deeply bleed and care deeply about. It's what sustains us. 
But the thing that struck me on that Monday of that GBF was not the first parable of Luke 18, but was the second parable of Luke 18. Because Jesus is not only telling us and giving us a call to say, I want to see day and night, I want to see persistent prayer for the, for the, uh, for the purpose of breakthrough come, but I want to see a specific culture and revelation that would saturate the people that are in the prayer room. I want to release a specific revelation of myself and a specific revelation of the posture of their heart that would set the culture of the prayer movement. And Jesus takes us into this second parable, and that's what I want to begin with this afternoon. And this is the heart posture that God wants to release to us. Look at verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So now we have two people coming to the prayer room. And Jesus is going to first describe the prayer life of the Pharisee, and then he's going to describe the prayer life of the tax collector. Verse 11, he says, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. So he's talking to himself, and the first words out of his mouth is, God, I thank you that I'm not like the extortioners. I'm not like other men. I'm not like extortioners. I'm not like the unjust. I'm not like adulterers. And then he looks over to his right, and he looks at this other guy praying in the same prayer room, and he goes, I'm not even like this tax collector. Look at verse 12. He then continues on, and he's now going to lay out his spiritual disciplines that he lays out every week. He goes, I fast twice a week. I mean, that's pretty good. I fast twice a week, and I give. I give tithes of all that I possess. I give and I fast. That is the first person's prayer life before God. God, I thank you. I'm not like other people. I'm not like the sinners of the day, and I'm not even like this guy over here. So we have that guy. And now Jesus is going to give us the other guy's approach. And then the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. So he's got his head down, and the Bible says that he beats his chest, and this is the only prayer that comes out of him. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be, exalt, be exalted. And the Holy Spirit just began to highlight to me this parable. And I began to get undone with this. And I felt like God saying, Corey, I want to see a revelation of mercy touch you at a deeper level. And I want to see it touch the prayer movement across the earth as I began to release prayer in high schools and churches and ministries. As I began to fill the earth with prayer. This is the posture that I want. Not a bunch of people that are sticking their chest out and more conscious of what they've done for God and out of touch with what God has done for them. He says, I want to see comparison of spiritual disciplines and the comparison of comparing themselves with one another killed. Because I'm here to tell you, comparison is a killer of prayer, and it's a revealer of self-righteousness. This whole man's caught up in what he's not, and the other guy says this, I'm just glad to be in the room. I'm just glad to be in the room. As he began to cry out to the Lord, God, be merciful to me as a sinner. We are about to see prayer rooms filled across the earth and he's going to take the worst of the worst of the worst, and he's going to fill them. He's going to fill our prayer rooms with prostitutes, with drug addicts. I'm a former drug addict that had a radical encounter with Jesus, February 18, 1997. A young man that grew up knowing about God but didn't know him, and once athletics was out of the equation, I ran hard into how high could I get and when I found myself in a place in my life to where I was doing every drug, every way, and I was bent on complete destruction, and I just want to be honest with you, I was at a place in my life that if God did not intervene, 
I would not have made it much longer. But on February 18th, 1997, in a college parking lot, after a friend spoke the gospel to me, I told him I don't want anything to do with it. He took me back to the school, and right before I got out of the van, the Holy Spirit filled the van. And I began to shake violently like I was having a seizure. He pulled in the back of the parking lot and started praying. And after a little bit, when the enemy was trying to choke me and keep me from saying the name Jesus, I finally, at the top of my lungs, screamed, Jesus. And as soon as I cried out the name Jesus, the hole broke off my throat. God came and breathed into my mouth. And after a couple of minutes, I heard a voice as clear as day saying, Corey, get out of the van, get on the pavement, and give me your life. You are mine. And on February 18, 1997, I experienced the mercy of God as God delivered me from everything in one touch of the presence of God. And over the last 20 years of going hard after Him, God is not just a one-time set apart in a salvation experience. Whenever God wants to release a new season in my life, He releases a fresh revelation of His mercy. And this is all I could say on that Monday of GBF. God, thank you that I get to be in the room. Thank you that I get to be in the room. Because God, I don't, I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be here. Outside of your mercy, none of us deserve to be in this room. I don't care how great it is. And I believe that God wants to release a revelation of his mercy that kills self-righteousness that kills that religious eye, that kills comparison, that kills we're doing this, 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 and this, and we compare ourselves by ourselves, and he wants to open up the floodgates of heaven as we begin to come into contact with the revelation of his mercy, his compassion, his tenderness, his kindness. The mercy of God is the deep bowels of God that shows compassion to weak, broken, frail human beings. His mercy lifts you up, lifts you out, redeems you, forgives you, satisfies you, and crowns you with love and kindness. And we're going to see a new culture fill it because to the ones that receive it the most, hearts are swelling, walls are broken, and the mercy you receive is the mercy you'll give. He wants to undo us with it. He wants to undo us with it. And so I've begun to go on a search over these last couple of weeks. God, show me the mercy of God. Undo me. God, I'm grateful to be in the room. I mean, who's grateful to be in this room right now? I was telling our ATC last night, you guys are my heroes. I, I, I'm just so grateful because I've made every decision not to be in this room. And God in his kindness has kept me, has sustained me, has delivered me. I love Psalm 18. He says, when the pangs of death surrounded me. He says, when sorrows surrounded me, he says, when I was surrounded on every side, it says that God sent from above and he delivered me. He says he pulled me out of many places and he delivered me because he delighted in me. Turn to Exodus 32. I want to talk about the mercy of God today. Some of you are going to experience it for the first time. There will come some of you that will come into a saving faith of Jesus Christ. I want you to know there's mercy for you today. There's forgiveness for sins. For some of you who are living in backsliddenness and living in bondage to sin, there's mercy today. We never graduate from the fact that we don't even belong in this room, and I'm so grateful to be here. Exodus 32 through 34 might, it's among the top two or three encounters between a man and God and the whole word of God. It is Moses. They've come out of Egypt. They've traveled to Mount Sinai. And in Exodus 32, Moses is on top of Mount Sinai receiving the law and the Ten Commandments from God. And while he's up there, the children of Israel begin to get they begin to wonder, where is he at? And they begin to wonder what's going on in the delay. So what do they do? They begin to create this golden calf, worship the golden calf. And God begins to tell Moses, Moses, get down there. I'm about to kill the whole nation and start over with you. Moses says, God, don't do it. 
Why would you bring them all the way out here just to kill them? What are the Egyptians going to think? What are the other nations going to think if you bring them out here just to kill them? God have mercy, and God relented from that at that moment. Moses comes down the mountain, sees what's going on, says the ones who are on God's side get on this side, the other one's over here, and we see the Levites come forth, and 3,000 die as the Levites kill. We see civil war among the camp. A plague breaks out. And now the issue becomes, what are you going to do? God is with them. God has decided not to kill the nation. But now how is he going to interact with the nation? How is a holy God going to interact with the sinful people to bring them forth into the promises of God? And the Lord begins to tell Moses, Moses, because of what just happened, I'll go, among, I'll go before you. I'll send my angel out ahead of you or I'll go around you, but I'm not going in the middle of you because if I go in the middle of you, I'll kill everybody. And we begin to see the interaction in Exodus 33 between God and Moses as Moses begins to plead with God. God, you can't just go before us and you can't go behind us or to the right or the left. We need you to go into, go into the midst of us. And God keeps telling Moses, Moses, I ha you have favor in my sight. You have grace in my sight. But Moses kept saying, God, I need more than just my personal thing with you. I need you to go among us. And that's the power of an intercessor, is an intercessor isn't just satisfied with their own personal favor with God. They say, God, it's not enough just for me and you. We need you in the middle of all of us. Intercessors pull God, saying, God, have mercy. And we get to see that with Moses in such a profound way. As you see the interaction, God keeps saying, I'll do it with you. you got to do it with us. I'll do it with you. you got to do it with us. And finally, God says, all right, then, I'll go amongst you. And in Exodus 33, when, God, when Moses begins to pull on the heart of God to go into their midst, we see, I would say, the greatest prayer ever prayed in the Bible. Exodus 33, 18, we know this, but it's so profound. Look at verse 17, and it will build to it. He says, I will also do this thing that you've spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. So now Moses has gotten God's attention and saying, okay, Moses, we'll do this. And then what does Moses pray? And then he said, please show me your glory. Please show me your glory. This is a man that saw the 10 plagues in Egypt. This is a man who saw the Red Sea split in two. This is a man who saw the miraculous power of God and he is calling on something deep in the heart of God that had never been revealed in such a manifest way, in such a personal way. And Moses is saying, there's only one calling card that I have for you to go into our midst. I want you to show us your glory. Show me your glory. The revelation of who you are. I wonder what Moses thought he was going to get when he prayed that. Did he think he would get a light show? Did he think he would get explosions? I mean, heck, the, the mountain had been on fire. God descended in the mountain. It had been spectacular. What did Moses think when he prayed, show me your glory? I want your glory. I want the deeper parts of you. I want the revelation of you that you would forever settle it for generations to come, who you are and who you are to Israel. He called on it, and I believe God is reviving that prayer in this hour. God, show a generation your glory. Show us your glory. How is God going to answer it? Look at verse 19. And then he says, this is how I'll answer this. I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Now lock in with me in verse 20. This is intense. But God says there's only one condition. You can't see my face. For no man shall see my face and live. And the Lord says, here is a place by me, and you shall stand in the rock. So it will be that while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. And then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So he says, you want to see my glory, Moses? He goes, yes. He goes, okay, at this time tomorrow, I'll descend in the cloud, 
and I'm going to reveal to you my glory. Look at Exodus 34, verse 5. Now, the next day, Moses gets up early, comes up the mountain, and now we're about to see the encounter. This is holy scriptures right here. I want you young people to lock in on this. This is holy. So the Lord descended in the cloud, and he stood with him there. And he began to proclaim the name of the Lord, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. He descended and he proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression. God says, you want to see my glory? This is what he does. I want everybody to look at me because this is so vivid of a scene. He goes, okay, Moses, you want to see my glory? This is what we're going to do. I'm going to show up to you tomorrow. I'm going to put you in the, in the cleft of the rock. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to descend, and I'm going to walk by you with my hand over your face. And I'm going to walk by you, and while I'm walking by you, I will be proclaiming my name over you. And as he passed by, he began to declare the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, abounding in loving kindness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. And he says, and as soon as I've gotten to where you can't see my face, I'll remove my hand so you can see my back. What is he revealing of himself right here? And I began to ask the Lord for years. I read this passage, and I began to, to ask myself. I, get, I got angry. I got bombed. I go, God, he was just talking to you face-to-face -face several verses earlier. You would talk face-to-face -face with Moses as a friend, and he had a revelation of your face. But what's going on right here? Why does he get the second visitation? Why does he not get to see your face? And the Lord told me several months ago, he goes, Corey, he goes, it's not just found in my face. He goes, what was it that Moses was seeing in my back? that was connected to the revelation of the merciful God. And as I've begun to wrestle with this, and we, you study the prophets and you see many times in the New Testament where the, it says in like 1 Peter 1 that the prophets searched carefully that the Messiah was going to come in suffering and in glory. Could it have been that Moses saw a foretaste of the coming day that there's only one way I can go up into your midst, Israel? And that there's coming a day to where there'll be a revelation of my nature in my back that will reveal to a generation that I am the merciful, gracious, kind, forgiving God. He wants us to see his back. I want to behold this man. I want to behold this. And what does God declare over us? Merciful. We would think light show. God says glory is mercy. Glory is kindness. Glory is grace. Glory is forgiveness. We're going to look here in a second at Micah chapter 7 where he says, who is a God like you? What separates our God from every other God? From, the, from, Muslim, from Islam, from Buddhism, from every ism out there, what separates our God from every other God? He is the God who forgives. He is the God who washes. He's the God that reveals himself as merciful, kind, and gracious. There's no one like our God. There's no one like our God. He wants to break down the walls. Dams are going to break today. Dams of rejection, dams of secret sin are going to break on the inside of you today. Strongholds of God are going to begin to break on the inside of you today. You're going to begin to come off the back row of Christianity and in religiosity and comparing yourself, and you're going to come into a place of full, here I am, God. I need you. This is who I am. And the ones that grow in that revelation are going to be the ones that are going to bring great freedom to others. Are you with me today? This is good. I want to look at two Old Testament passages that highlight this. Psalm 103. 
Psalm 103 lays out several benefits for what God does. It says that he forgives our sins. He heals our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction. He crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. And he satisfies our mouth with good things. Psalm 103, he says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a pity, as a father pities his children, so the father, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Micah chapter 7, who is a God like you? Who is a God like you pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever. Get a hold of this. One of the greatest phrases that I, if there's one phrase that I can lodge on the inside of your psyche for the rest of your life, it would be this next phrase out of Micah chapter 7. The Bible says that God, he delights in mercy are you with me this afternoon he delights in mercy he enjoys showing mercy to you he doesn't tolerate you he doesn't put up with you he doesn't want you show up once again to ask forgiveness for that situation or that sin that has caught you up he doesn't say are you still struggling with that when are you going to get this right here's some forgiveness now go get it right He doesn't just tolerate showing you mercy. He actually delights in showing you mercy. In Isaiah chapter 30, it says that he longs to be gracious to you. God longs to be gracious to you. And at the sound of your cry, he will break in speedily because he is looking for opportunities to show you mercy. Now, I know when I say that, we have all the what ifs, but let that speak on the inside of you right now. God delights in showing you mercy. He enjoys it. He will again have compassion on us and subdue our iniquities. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your mercy, God. Thank you, God, that you are going to raise up a bunch of people in prayer rooms across the earth and believers across the earth that are going to extol and magnify, saying, who is a God like you? I thank you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you forgive sin. I thank you, God, that you pass over, that you wash us, not just one time, but that you continually pursue us and delight in showing us mercy. I want to look at two gospel stories and then we'll end and pray for you today. I like to say the tale of two tables. That God shows up several times in tables and he reveals parts of his heart. Psalm 23, it says that he will prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And that God does things around tables in the Gospels and in the Word of God where he reveals part of his heart. It was around a table, a breakfast table, where Jesus pulled out the arrows of Peter's defeat and denial and washed him and commissioned him to be the rock for the early church. It was around a breakfast table where Jesus declared and affirmed his weak yet real love pulled the arrows out and prophesied and commissioned him as a shepherd to the early church. On the road to Emmaus, those disciples did not know Jesus until he came into their house and as soon as he sat at their table, took the bread and broke it, their eyes were opened. There's revelation around tables in the word of God and as soon as they knew that it was him, he vanished. I love the Roman centurion of Matthew chapter 8 where this man is getting a hold of kingdom realities and how this man's accessing the faith of the God of Israel and Jesus began to prophesy of a day to where many are going to come from the east and the west and they're going to sit down with Abraham at his table in the age to come. Which means there's going to be a great gathering of the outcast, of the foreigner, of the dirty, 
of the broken, of the defiled that are going to come and that are going to sit in that royal place with Abraham and inherit the promises in the age to come. There's a revelation of mercy around tables. And in Matthew chapter 9, we're going to see it once again, and I love it for this. Jesus, in verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. I love where Jesus went to go find his apostles. He shows up to Matthew and he says one word to him. You just got the golden ticket, Matthew. Follow me. As I was worshiping and meditating during worship today, I was thinking, thinking about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and those golden tickets of being brought. I mean, only a handful are brought into such a glorious experience. And Jesus is going around the region handing out golden tickets. He's showing up to fishermen. He's showing up to this and that. And he's showing up to all kinds of people. And then he shows up in the middle of the tax office and he hands a golden ticket to this sinner, this tax collector named Matthew. And as soon as Jesus handed that ticket and says, follow me to Matthew, it's almost like a dam broke in that region. And now all of a sudden, we're going to see in the very next verse, when Jesus sat down at the table, many tax collectors and sinners began to flock in. It's almost like the calling of Matthew broke a dam, began to shift a paradigm of God, and we begin to see a mass movement of sinners, tax collectors, and the defiled that begin to say, if there's hope for him, there's hope for us. We can come into this. We can come into this, and all of them start running to the table, and they sit down with Jesus at the table. I love Jesus that they were completely comfortable in his presence. I begin to ask myself on the areas of me that want to live at a distance and live in religiosity and all my facades and all my comparison with other people. I'm like, God, you accept me. And in the same way, these people are comfortable in your presence. I want to be completely comfortable as your mercy draws me near to come out of the shadows of religion and false selves and false uh, uh, things that I set off to other people. I want to come out of the shadows and I want to sit at the table with you. I want those areas in my heart, and not only that, I want to become a man that would begin to release a magnet to everywhere I go, everywhere I walk, that there would be a magnet that sinners would be comfortable in my presence. Jesus is going to get to taking them on, but the point that he drew to him is, oh my goodness, a dam broke, and there was a magnet on this man. I want that magnet on my life, don't you? Two of you want that. I'll pray for you after. Do you know what keeps, keeps it from happening? All of our religious walls. All of our religiosity. All of us looking like the Pharisee in Luke 18. Just so grateful that I'm not like him and I'm not like her. My sins aren't that bad. I'm actually doing pretty good. I got a good name. My dad's the pastor. My dad's the youth pastor. I've known God my whole life. I've never done anything wrong. I'm not like those people. And you live constantly what you're not instead of what he's done for you. That's the shift. You never graduate from that. We see this magnet released, and as soon as the ugly ones, the dirty ones, start filling the house and sitting with Jesus at the table, now we're about to have a showdown. Now the religious spirit's going to get stirred up. The Pharisees begin. They won't even ask Jesus outright. They just ask the disciples, why is your teacher eating with dirty people? Why are they eating with defiled perverts? Why are they eating with murderers? Why are they eating with sinners and tax collectors? Why is he doing this? And it says when Jesus heard that, which means, oh no, dad just heard something. He's about to go off on you. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus was saying, only sick people know they need a doctor. And there's only half of you that know that you're sick. 
He says, I've come for sick people. I've come as the great physician to heal the great sin, uh, sin-ridden soul that's been bound in darkness, bound by demons, bound by the devil. I have come as the great physician to heal the sin-ridden soul and to release healing for the most jacked up, broken of all people. I've only come for the sick. And here's the point, Pharisees. All of you are sick. But only half of you know you're sick. And the quicker you come into terms with the depth of your sickness, then the physician will show up to you. He says, go and learn what this means. And Jesus says, I love this. He says, he begins to hit them on this. I just want to read this. Because the only people that need a physician are sick people. You both need me, but only one of you know you need me. Both of you are sick, but only one of you realize that you're sick. And if, I'm only, if you're only into me eating with righteous people, I'm only going to be eating by myself because I'm the only one righteous. If that's your big thing is that I, don't associate, I only associate with righteous people, then I'm going to live lonely because I'm the only one righteous here. And then Jesus says, okay, you Pharisees, I love it. He says this. He tells them, he says, to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Everybody say, go and learn. learn. Say it again. Say, "Go go and learn. Jesus is going to look at these Pharisees who pride themselves in doctorates in Old Testament theology and understanding of the law and the prophets and it's like Jesus showing up to you senior high students and, and, and he pulls out a passage, Hosea 6, where he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, which would have been duh to all these people. But it would be like Jesus showing up to you senior high students and say, go learn what one plus one equals and then we can go on a journey. I want you to go and learn the thing that you think you know so much about You don't have a clue, and you are so far from the reality that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Not only does Jesus delight in mercy, he desires mercy. What does that mean? That Jesus wants us to live a gratitude-based life instead of a works-based life. A life of thank you, God, that I get to be in the room instead of God, look at all that I've done for you, and now you owe me. Look at all the prayer hours I've put in. Look at all the fasting. Look at how far I've followed you through my teenage years. You owe me, God. It's time for you to pay up. That's why I see so many teenagers and 20-year-olds, they'll go hard after God for a season. They'll push in for it all, but there's a hidden motive, and the hidden motive is, I'm going to put in my work. God, you better do your part. And what begins to happen when they hit the walls of him not breaking in and their lives actually go in one direction versus the others, they begin to shift into an accusation. They begin to distance their heart from God, and I find them one after another leaving the faith because at the end of the day, God, wouldn't, oh, God wasn't paying them what they felt they were owed. And Jesus says, I, want, I have come to bring the kingdom. You understand this. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and I want you to go and learn it. You don't get this at a McDonald's drive through You don't get this by my hand laid on you. You don't get this by a book or a conference. It's something that is not natural to you. It's something that is as foreign to you as anything that's ever been foreign is the, is the reality of mercy and the understanding of mercy. He says you got to go and learn it. you got to understand it requires humility. It requires intentionality. You're not going to get this on the run. It's a process. There's going to be four steps forward and three steps back as your heart begins to grow in receiving his mercy, giving mercy, and then giving it to others. It's receiving it from him. It's giving it to yourself, and it's giving it to others. Go and learn. I desire mercy. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, these last 10 minutes, turn with me to Luke chapter 7. We're going to look at one more table.
I'm going to love this next one. You're going to look in verse 36 of Luke 7 and to where the first one in Matthew 9, Jesus went to the tax collectors and he was eating with them. Now he's about to say yes from a Pharisee and his invitation to come and eat with him. I want to say something to everybody in here. Jesus, the father loves the older son bound in religion as much as he loves the younger son bound in sin. And I love Jesus that he just doesn't do it this way, but he actually accepted the invitation and he says, I'll eat with you as well. It's a really good point. It changes things because some of you are really bound in religion. And I want you to know he has mercy on you. And he's going to bring you to a place to where you learn it. Look at verse 36. Here we go. Then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come and eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that it was Jesus that sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of very costly oil. I'm going to read the whole thing and then I'm going to just lay this out to you. And she stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears, wipe them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who or what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He says, Teacher, say it. He says, There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500, the other 50. When they both had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and says, I suppose the one who forgave him more. He says, you've rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet from the time I walked in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, the same loves little. Then he said, your sins are forgiven. Those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus, and I, I, I love this. Again, these gospel stories are so vivid. I want to invite you into looking at these stories. Jesus sitting at the table. I picture it like this. He's sitting at the table. He's heading this way, facing this way. And from the back of the room comes a woman who everybody in the city knows is a sinful woman. History tells us it's Mary Magdalene who in the very next chapter in Luke chapter 8, we're going to see that she had seven demons cast out of her. Seven demons. I mean, that's a pretty intense. Who are you? I'm the girl that had seven demons cast out. It seems that there had been a previous encounter with Jesus where she had encountered this great deliverance and now she hears that Jesus is at this Pharisee's house and now out of the overflow of mercy, the overflow of forgiveness, and the wondering, will Jesus be the same to me in public as he was to me in private? See, this woman was used to being treated a certain way in private, and then once they got to public places, men would act like they didn't know her. They would disdain her. I have nothing to do with that girl, but yet would meet her in the private place. And now she's about to break in. And what does she have? The alabaster flask of costly oil. And from the time she walks in, Jesus facing that way. She breaks into the room, stands behind his feet. She begins to cry over his feet. Take her hair. Begin to wash his feet. Begin to kiss his feet. And begin to take the oil and wash his feet. She's weeping, she's washing, she's wiping, she's kissing, and she's anointing. This is exploding around Jesus as she's broken into the room. This thing is going on, and all of a sudden, the guy across the room starts thinking to himself. If this man, and now it's going to be the litmus test of whether this man is a man of God or not, whether Jesus is truly a prophet, the Pharisee begins to think, if this man were a prophet, 
he would know who this woman is, what kind of woman she is, for she's a sinner and she's touching herself. This is the litmus test, is whether or not he knows who she is. This is all going on around her. She, he begins to think thoughts. She's weeping, crying. It's all craziness in the room. And all of a sudden, Jesus begins to speak to Pharisee based on his thoughts. Who in here knows that Jesus will address your thoughts? And do you know that thoughts are words before God? Thoughts are words before God. And Jesus begins to pose it. He knows what he's thinking. And Jesus is about to say, yes, I am a prophet. And you think you know who this woman is, but I'm here to tell you who she was, but who she is is new in my eyes. But the greater issue that's going on is I know who you are. And by the end of this whole thing, you're going to know who I am. And Jesus now begins to say, Simon, I have a question. And he goes, ask it. And Jesus begins to give this little story about two people that owed money to a debtor. One owed a lot, one owed a little. The creditor forgave them both. And now the question becomes to the Pharisee, which of them is going to love the creditor more for receiving forgiveness? And he goes, I suppose the one who was forgiven more. And now Jesus asks the key question in it all. Jesus says, you have rightly judged. Look at verse 44. And then he turned to the woman. So now he's been talking to her, him while she's doing this. And now he's going to look at her but keep talking to Simon. He goes, do you see this woman? He turns to the woman and he says, do you see this woman? That becomes the key core question is, how do you evaluate and how do you define this woman? You have quickly written her off as a sinner, but I'm about to lay the discrepancy, the, the, the difference between who she is and who you are. He says, from the time I walked in, she's been he says, she's been washing my feet. You didn't wash my feet. Just look at this. I want you to look at this in your Bible. He says, do you see with this woman, I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and she's wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. That's what I want to see in a generation. He goes, you think you know her. He goes, you don't have a clue who she is. This woman right here that you say is a sinner, I'm here to tell you right now that she loves me so much more than you do. You never gave me anything for my feet. You never kissed me. You never gave me any anointing. But this woman has been lavishing my feet with oil, with kisses, with wiping and anointing oil because of one revelation has struck her life. She's been forgiven much. And here is the principle, everybody here, is that you will only love God to the degree that you receive his mercy. And that you will only grow in love for God to the degree that you receive his tender forgiveness in your life. When you receive his mercy, tenderness, and kindness in your life, what that does is it begins to swell your heart in love and it begins to release an extravagance, a gratitude, a, a, a giving of yourself, a giving of your time, a giving of your energy. It's not about a list of what you've done for him. It is the only proper response based on what he's given you. And here's the revelation we desperately need because I run into a lot of people, myself included, we don't have a clue. We know what happened at an altar time 20 years ago, and thank you for forgiving me. But what does it look like as we run through life 
And as we hit those walls in our life, some of us, you young people, we hit it last night as we saw the mercy of God wash over you. We are in the middle of an epidemic, a pornography epidemic that is raping the soul of a generation. It's coming at us through every venue, our phones, our TVs, our computers. It's coming through our televisions, our commercials. We're under an assault and there is warfare in the secret places. Some of us have begun to slip up and slip into these areas and engage in these areas and we run from God and yet we have all that. My hands are lifted, I love you Jesus, but the Lord is saying I want the walls to break and I want you to encounter my mercy right here. I want to wash you in your deepest places of shame, your deepest places of humiliation, your deepest place. I want you to give me those places. We have young girls in this room that are cutting themselves, that are given to eating disorders, that are just debating their body because they don't look like the model in the magazine. We've bought into a lie of what is beautiful, what is what will get a man. We define masculinity in certain ways and we measure ourselves by the sights and the sounds and the definitions of the culture. And yet we encounter this in our personal life and yet we have the youth group game. We'll live at a distance. You can live dull. You can live defiled. But I'm here to tell you, I want to join Jesus at the table. I want to come out of my chains, come out of my bondage, and I want to join him at the table saying, this is who I am. Because, Amen. Because he wants to wash you today. He wants you to bring those deepest, most shameful, most vulnerable areas. Do you know what I love about the, the prodigal son story? It all happened while he was still a great way off. That younger son who had just returned, it says while he was still a great way off, the father saw him. The father had compassion. The father ran towards him, kissed him, robed him, ringed him, and gave him a second inheritance as if he never lost the inheritance in the first place. And here, this is what hits me. A lot of us will say this to God. God, stay up there. I'm going to prove to you how I can in my own strength get up to the porch so then I'll get the embrace. And the father would say to you, no, you've got to understand. You've got to receive my mercy while you're still a great way off. And it's the power of receiving my mercy while you're still a great way off that's going to empower you to walk forward into your destiny and walk into the Father's house. I love that Micah 7 passage. It says that his compassion will subdue our iniquities. He's going to overcome your iniquities, but you know what we're going to We're going to come out of religiosity. Religious hides. Religiosity protects. It guards. It lives at a distance. And the Lord's saying, I'm coming in, and I'm going to break walls. I'm going to sever dividers. I'm going to remove hindrances. This ain't about the only the strong survive. It's only the ones that are in contact with the mercy of God that are going to thrive and survive who will have swelling hearts to give it to masses. Because the lost world's not going to come to our little youth groups. They're going to come to people who have broken through religiosity into a revelation of mercy. Amen? Amen. Last thing, who, did, who was the first person Jesus showed up to after the resurrection? He showed up to that woman. One of my favorite words in the Bible is Mary. Who is Jesus going to show up to first after it all? It's Mary. And I believe that he wants to show up to many Marys. He wants to show up to Matthews today. He wants to call you out of your darkness, call you out of your, your lies, call you out of your pits, and to begin to call you into a revelation of mercy that's going to shift your life. Amen. Let's stand. I'm just going to ask it right here at the beginning. I just want to ask right now, first off, Ephesians 2, 4 says that God is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy and the love with which he loved us while we were still dead in our sins. Is there anybody in here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? 
you've never given your life to him for me. It was February 18th, 1997. For some of you, it might have been when you were a little kid. It doesn't matter. But today is the day of salvation. If you want to know the mercy of God for the first time in your life to bring you out of bondage, to break the power of darkness, and to bring you into the kingdom, if you want to know and give your life to Jesus Christ right now, I want to ask you to raise your hand right now all over this room. If there's anybody in here who wants to give your life to Jesus, Because I'm here to tell you, thank you. I'm here to tell you right now what's going to fill prayer rooms, what's going to fill day and night, what, how are we going to go day and night until he returns. It's not going to just be professional. It's not going to be professional prayers that are going to fill prayer rooms across the earth, professional intercessors. It's going to be Mary Magdalene's, Matthew the tax collector's, people that have been undone with the kindness and mercy, goodness and gentleness of God that is saying, I don't belong here, but God in his mercy has put me in this room and I want to give more, anoint more, serve more, love more. I want to stay 30 more minutes in the room. Let me stay 30 more minutes in the room. Let me sing one more song. But Corey, you've been here for 14 hours. It's nothing compared to the mercy that he has shown in my life. It's not about a list of how much you've done. It's a, I don't deserve to be here, and I want to savor every moment. I believe he wants to release a great washing and cleansing over many of us today. It doesn't take a... I just ask you right now, Father, we just ask you right now to come in this room. We need you, and I ask you to release a revelation of your mercy to our hearts. Joel 2 is all around one reality. Cry to me, the merciful God. Some of you are bound in... in uh, in darkness, some of you are bound in with pornography, eating disorders, self-hatred, self-mutilation. Many of you are bound with a spirit of death and depression. Suicidal tendencies and thoughts torment you. Jesus is saying, come to the table. There's room for you at the table. I want you to come and join me at the table because the sick ones are the ones that get healed. Some of you are bound with pornography. It's tormented you. A door got opened up to you that never should have been opened. Someone brought you into it and it's tormented you. The images, the emotions. Jesus is saying, come join me at the table. I have healing for your soul. I have healing that's going to break the power of darkness and break the power of the evil one in your life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just rest upon us. Some of us are gripped with tormenting images at night. We, you can't sleep at night. The spirit of fear torments you. Bring it to Jesus. Come to the table. Just want to ask across this room right now, if you want to say, God, I'm going to come and join you at the table with an area in my life that I'm bringing open before you right now. Between me and you, God, I want to open it up to you right now. And I want you to come and release the medicine called mercy to my soul. I want to experience the one who forgives and heals and delivers and crowns. I want to invite you up here right now. We want to pray for you. You want to bring anything. If you want to come join him at the table right now, come up here. Stand on these lines right here. We want glory to pass before us. Come on, spread on in. You on the second row, take a half a step in. Everybody take a half a step in. Just plow in.
Father, we just ask you right now, just look at him right now. I want you to look at his eyes. I want you to look at his eyes right now. And I want you to bring that issue right now before him. I want you to bring it before him right now. Bring that area. Bring bondage to pornography. Bring bondage to eating disorders. Bondage to self-hatred. Lord, we bring it right now before your throne. It is a throne of grace. And we come to the throne to find mercy and grace in time of need. God, we ask you to forgive us for all open doors with darkness. We ask you to cleanse us and forgive us for all agreement with darkness, every act, every thought, every deed that we've done in secret. God, we confess that it's sin right now before your throne. And we ask you right now for the blood of Jesus to cleanse us. We ask right now for the blood of Jesus to wash over us right now. God, have mercy upon us right now. Just wait in His presence right now. Holy Spirit, come. join you at the table right now, Holy Spirit. We're just going to ask Him right now to break off. We're going to ask for new eyes to see Jesus. Because you need new eyes to see yourself. New eyes to see God and new eyes to see yourself. Father, we just ask you to come right now and release your power. God, we ask you to cleanse our eyes right now. Wash away, God, our eyes. Just cleanse us.
merciful God. Show us your glory, God. Pass before us, and I declare it over you right now. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, abounding in goodness, keeping mercy for thousands. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, abounding in goodness, keeping mercy for thousands. The Lord, the Lord God.
You can 